Deep down, we all knew we wouldn't stay in our tropical paradise forever. Six months after our arrival, news of another bigger U-boat arriving in port reached us. The crew gathered at port, and for the first time, we saw a milk cow. Back home, the war wasn't going well for us or the Japanese allies. The Kriegsmarine had cooked up a daring new plan and needed experienced U-boat crews and daring captains. That night, my crew gathered at Olaf's to discuss our course of action. Many wanted to stay. Columbia offered them a life they couldn't have back home. A few wanted to return, either homesick or due to a sense of duty. I made it clear each man would choose his own fate, and no judgment would be made. Of the officers, only Eric and Dieter chose to return. A handful of the crew also chose duty over a long, easy life in the Caribbean. The next morning, the entire crew of the Defiance gathered for one last time to bid farewell to those who chose to return. Olaf cooked up one last special meal, a glorious breakfast, this time with no hint of diesel fuel. After, we said our goodbyes and boarded the milk cow. On the long voyage back to Kiel, the Defiance crew members were treated like heroes. We were brought up to speed on the situation in the Atlantic, as well as crewmen of a U-boat could understand it anyway, and it was clear the situation was beginning to turn. The Americans were becoming more organized by the day. United States and Royal Navy destroyers were sinking U-boats in alarming numbers. The Allies had new, forward-facing weapons to attack U-boats more precisely. And while the new Enigma machines appeared to be doing their job, losses were mounting. When we returned to Kiel, we were greeted by Donuts himself. We, we were sat down, and the situation was explained bluntly to us, along with our new postings. Eric, with his friends in high places and strong belief in National Socialism, was given the desk job he always dreamed of. Assigned to Donuts's personal staff, his duties mainly involved saluting high-ranking party officials and ensuring every U-boat left port with enough copies of Mein Kampf for each crew member to find solace in their Fuhrer's words. Dieter was given command of his own boat, <laughs> under the condition he never be posted across the Atlantic. Donuts agreed and assigned him to hunting British and American convoys bound for the Soviet Union up near the Arctic Circle close enough to ports in Norway to ensure his boat would stay in constant supply. My former XO and watch officer were then ushered out, and I sat alone facing Donuts. Needless to say, his plan was highly secret, and very ambitious. Our friends in the Pacific were facing challenges they never imagined. The initial string of successes Japan was so famous for were beginning to wane, and they needed our help. While I had been relaxing on the beaches of Colombia, sipping martinis and staring at beautiful women, the engineers back home had cooked up a new design of U-boat, the Type 9. Bulkier and less maneuverable than the Type 7, the Type 9 had an operational range that meant it could support the Japanese. However, it would be no cakewalk. Dunitz knew he needed captains with experience. However, the war had taken its toll and they were in short supply. I was one of the few captains remaining who had actually served in the Baltic when the war started who had raided ports, sunk both merchant and capital ships, and knew the risks involved with long-distance operations. And critically, I still struck fear into the hearts of the enemy. Under the condition that each crew member who remained in Columbia was granted a full pardon for their desertion, I agreed to take command of one of these new boats and strike fear into the hearts of British and American sailors half a world away.